Rev and CTRE's uh, control systems, how to configure them, how to put firmware in there, how to do the CAM IDs on there, um, doing your robo uh, your RoboReel image on there, that has to be done no matter what. We'll talk more in a minute about that. And what needs to be updated for the season coming up in 2024. We'll also be talking about radio configurations, guard station overview with uh, debug help, uh, the radio configurations within also tips and tricks of everything that go along with it as we see and things we see when we're coaching robots at events. So just give a quick overview snapshot. If you're going to use the complete CTRE control system, which a lot of you guys don't use anymore, but that's what it looks like. You have your power distribution board in the middle, you have your your speed controller, motor controller is all on the left there. You have your pneumatic system tied in there with all the things with that. With your solenoids, compressor, relief valves, and your uh, uh, switch to see if it's in uh, the right pressure or not. And then of course you get your roll reel and your radio over to the right there. And any other I.O. that comes off of that. If you're using a rev system, this would be if you use 100% the rev system. Um, there's a slight difference in the components there. Um, you'll see the difference in the pneumatic hub and the radio. With the instead of the BRM, you would see the power over Ethernet module right there, and then we go right to the radio there, and then you still have all the rest of things in. Now, a lot of teams are using a mix of these, which is perfectly legal as far as we know for 2024. But we'll pay attention to the rules when they come out at kickoff. I want to talk about the Robo Real Imaging 1 and 2. So go ahead, Logan. Yeah, so the main heart of your control system, if you're not familiar with it or maybe you're new to this, um, the Robo Real, that's these gray boxes here. I have a version 1 as well as version 2 up here since we'll so since they're a little bit different. Uh, but this is the heart of your control system. Your code runs there, all the devices connect back to there, the networking goes through there, that's what your driver station talks to. That is the heart of your robot. Um, so to image this, every year there's going to be a new image released from NI, who is the vendor who develops all the software for it. And there's a couple different ways we have to do that. For this version one, it's done over USB. So that's this cable here. It's like a big square printer cable, if you've ever looked at those. And on the newer one, it actually uses a little micro SD card. So kind of like you put in a camera, GoPro, thing like that. And this is kind of how that would look. You have to install the NI game tools every year. So that's just a program you put on your laptop. It installs the driver station, the RoboRio imaging tool, as well as some other utilities. And it'll look like that on your desktop. And this is what that program actually looks like. So in, the, in that imaging utility, when you plug it into your reel like this, you should see it pop up in that left box up there. It'll show like RoboRio and then your team number. Or if it's a new RoboRio, it'll be zeros. Um, but with this, it's super easy. You just select the image in that box on the right, hit format, and wait about five, ten minutes. It takes a little bit, just writes it to it, and you're good to go there. Yeah, so things that catch a lot of teams on this point here is you see the IP address of 172.22.11.2. There's a driver that is installed with the NI toolkit that will take this cable that you plug in USB to your laptop and it'll create an Ethernet adapter that will reconfigure it. And a lot of teams get hung up that it doesn't connect. You cannot do this through the Ethernet port. You have to use the USB cable. On. Yep. Yeah, so it's just kind of a step-by-step -step of what you do with it. First you click on it, you have to enter your team number since that actually sets the IP address of the RoboRio. So that's how your computer as well as other devices know how to talk to it. And that IP address is based on your team number, so that's really important. Um, then you would hit Format Target. That other button is for updating firmware. As far as I know, they have not updated the actual firmware of the RoboRio in years now. So that's probably going to be fine for yours. But you'll hit Format Target, and then in that Select Image box, you just click whatever the newest image is. I think it's 2024 1.1 right now. Then you hit Format. Then you just wait a little bit. So yeah, then you'll see that progress bar come up. It'll show a dialog box at the end that says it's complete, here's your IP address, and you're good to go there. And if you have issues with it, this happens really often at events when people are in a hurry or things are moving around. Sometimes that cable will get bumped and it'll get interrupted in the middle of it, so you'll get an error like this. 
Usually you can fix it by just retrying it. Um, sometimes something else happened to it. And you can try by accessing it through that local IP address that's up there. So that's that IP that gets created by the USB cable. If you can access it there, then you can usually see what happened to it. You can see what version it's on. You can check its IP address. Um, most of the time, you just have to restart it. Every once in a while, you might have to do a full reset of the Roborio. There's a reset button on it that you essentially just hold down. And then it should be good. It's rare case, you might have to go into safe mode on there and do it. Yep. Or else get a touch with from one of us CSAs, and we'll probably help you out on that. Yep. Yeah, so this is the other big thing. Um, on Windows laptops, they have a firewall enabled by default. This is a huge headache for FRC robotics in general. That firewall tends to block a lot of the network communications that you need to actually talk to your robot, as well as do this process. So one of the first troubleshooting steps is just to turn that off, and you can just search for it, Windows firewall in the search bar, you'll see it pop up. And... Especially when you first start up the, you start up the new install, it will probably ask you, Firewalls turn on, it'll yep. ask you to add it, an exception to it. But sometimes if you don't get quick enough, you might have to shut it down and restart it again to get a connection. Yeah, then that other thing was just talking about the firmware updates. That was a thing that hasn't changed in a few years now, but if for some reason it does, you might have to do the firmware update on top of the imaging. Um, the Robo Rio 2, so that's this newer one that came out a year or two now ago. That's this guy right here. The biggest telltale that you can tell it's a Rio 2 is it has this different logo on it. It doesn't say LabVIEW on it like the old one does. It also has an SD card slot. So this one is a little different because the image in the software that runs on this Rio is on that SD card. It's not inside the Rio itself. So we have to take that SD card out and we got to put it into a computer. So with this, in that same RoboRio tool, on that window on the right, you'll see that SD card icon, that little circled folder icon. If you hit that, it'll open a dialog box that shows where this image is. It's just a big zip file. And then you're going to use some tool to write to the SD card. So if you've ever used a Raspberry Pi, you probably had to image those before. It's the same utility like that. Raspberry Pi imager, uh, Bolina Etcher is another really popular one. You just select that. You select the blue button to pick that file where that it showed you when you hit that SD card button. Yep, just like that. Then you hit open, and you'll write it to that SD card. Really simple. Then you eject it and you put that in your Roborio. And this is really important. So that image that you wrote to the SD card does not know who you are. It doesn't know your team number. It's just a blank image. So once that's done, you would actually take this USB cable, plug it into there just like the old one, and then you have to go back to that utility and you set your team number. So for that, you would just type in your team number, hit Edit Startup Settings, and then Apply. And then it's all good. Very important. Do not forget that. You will not communicate with that. Yep. And again, it talks about firmware and as well on there. So this is another thing that comes up sometimes at events, especially when you're in a hurry. Um, that file that they hide for the Roborio image is kind of hidden. So there's the full path where it is, but I think they've improved it this year, where if you hit the SD card folder icon, it'll take you straight to it. So pretty easy to get to now. So devices, updates, what is needed to be updated and why? So what I tell teams is, don't, please don't show up to the event with 2023 code going into 2024. Please update them ahead of time so we get to the regional event, get ready to go with at least the new software. It's not an option. If you're using the Rev stuff, or excuse me, the CTRE stuff, they have an old legacy one with the uh, Phoenix tuner here, and this will come up and you can browse it and just put some temporary tool set on to the roll reel to find all your devices. And once you do this, you can bring this up here and you can select each one to add new firmware. The first thing I like to do is Set your CAN ID. Get your little piece of paper out, write it down so your programmer knows what motor, which manipulator, actuator, any other thing you're running on your robot has the proper CAN ID so you can program it correctly. Then you come in here and select it, and you can uh, write the firmware to it. This utility will let you write to all of them, to uh, all alike. One. So if you have a bunch of Falcons down there, or the Krakens on the other two, we'll show you in a moment, 
is you can select them all and then write some all to it. Usually you want to go find it, it's usually um, linked up correctly on here. The other thing that comes up is if you do not know which device you're talking to when you're setting the CAN ID, because if you have all brand new Falcons on your robot and you plug it all in and you set this utility, you're only going to find one because they're factory default to CAN zero. So if you're like, hey, there's something wrong with the wire, first thing you can do is change the CAN ID and then the next one will pop up in the line it finds. And you set that one. If you don't know, there's a flash of the under you can blink it. And I'm sure it should be on this screen here, where you can select that device and hit the blink function. We'll show you that in a minute, where you can flash it and it'll sit there and go back and forth with orange lights on there to tell you which device you're talking to. The other devices on there, if you're using the old um, PCM module, the Mac control module, that one will have to be due. They haven't changed any firmware in that in a long time. Um, and the power distribution board, if you're still using the CTRE, um, make sure it's got the current uh, firmware on there as well. It's very important to get the correct firmware on there. Um, a lot of times the FTIAs will come to us and say, a Team X has an issue with incompatible firmware. The FMS system is smart enough to detect that and sometimes will cause field issues. It's not field issue, it's your robot issue that you don't run the right firmware on there and I may not communicate properly. The new Phoenix, uh, <coughs> Phoenix uh, Tuner X here, uh, very good to you. We were playing with it this morning a little bit and we're gonna switch to it right now so we can look at it closer connected to a board. When it comes up, it'll have all the devices on here and it's got color coded on here. The color codes on here will tell us what's wrong. So we click on device like this Victor SPX here, it comes up here and it says new firmware is available now on it. Again, you gotta have the, the USB into the robo reel to see all your CAN devices. It's gotta be wired correctly, daisy chain. And one point about the daisy chain, make sure you have a turning resistor on the end. So I like to use start to roll a reel, go through all my devices and end at the power distribution board. Um, there's a switch on the new rev board and there's a jumper on the CTRE board that will terminate it and return it back so you can see all your devices. So on here I can hit the, the blink feature on there and you should see it blinking on there. It'll switch really fast on there. Now I know which device I'm looking at. And then I can hit the button here to update the firmware. If I hit the browse button, and it doesn't link like I should, and I thought it was linked correctly. Yeah, that's a good one, Logan. <coughs> so we're all going to learn together because I'm not sure where they put it. The new device. I have to look that up after. Should come. I'm surprised they didn't default it. And this is the beta one anyway on here for the 2024 on here. We should all do that and update it and we'll come back with that. If you hit the refresh button on here, it will give you all the status on here, um, what the controller is doing currently. It's got limit switches on there, it's got an encoder on there, plug it through there from the dot board. And it's got a clear function on here. If you ever see them in a default, like a sticky vault, they'll be flashing back and forth on you. And then you come in here and, and clear it. Here's the Falcon here. Same thing here. This one's already been updated. It's got unknown because it's got the beta firmware in it right now. But if I hit the refresh button on here, it's like in the old Phoenix tuner where you would do a self-test. Take a snapshot of it. This is what this is going to do. And you can see how uh, the state on here. It gives you all the information about that device as well. It shows the, it will also show some of the other ones on here too. It's got the, the Mac Hub on here and everything else, and then the PCM board. The other one is the rub board. I actually found it on here, but I can't do anything with it. And so here you can take a snapshot. If you had your board up and running one, you know if that someone was on, you could go here and look at the state of each one of them as well. Very cool utility on here to do it. Again, if you didn't know, you can see the CAN ID is 25 on this one. And what a lot of times like I like to do is when you get your device
devices, I have to put the name of it. It's front motor locked, or it's the intake motor, or it's the nuclear arm. You would put a name on it, and inside, you know, right into the flash door. Every time you boot it up, it will have everything in there that you can see, and you don't have to go back to some sheet of paper. You don't know what it is. Is there any questions on the Phoenix tuner? Things on that. If you're using the rev stuff, the rev hardware client that we just talked to Brandon Bell on has the, what's called the rev client on here. Very similar as you see in the Phoenix tuner on there. And we can flip to that one as well here. And you can see a device on here. You can see the Spark Max right here. This is where you have to pay attention in the configurations if you're using a brushless motor or a brush motor. Not many people are using the brush motors anymore, like the old sim motors. But you make sure that you put the right type right here. You can say brush or that, because they used to burn the Spark Maxes out if you're trying to run something that's not configured right. Especially when you're on a brushless motor on a, on a brush configuration. <coughs> Same thing here, it's got the sticky clear faults on here. You can see I can clear a few of them on here and burn to flash. Um, if you had an absolute color on here, that would come up in here, especially your swerve drives. You can bring that up here and zero it and then burn it to the flash or absolute color settings on here. Um, on here, this tells me with the symbol on there with exclamation point that it is out of uh, date for your firmware on here. And then you can hit the update button right here. This is a little more intuitive than the Phoenix one was.
saw the writing of the firmware on that one. The other thing is, if you're troubleshooting or trying to do a PID loop stuff on here, there's a great graphing utility, and Phoenix Tuner has the same similar stuff on there where you can tune it by graphing it out. And to get it, you can actually run the motors from here if you got power to the board and to your motors on there. You can do that. And it's a good tool to, to test everything prior to putting all your code in. Do you have a question? So did you have the board powered up and you had yeah. and you were trying to burn fly, uh, firmware from one device over to another one? Yeah. A lot of times I like to do that and make sure I'm plugged into that device. Sometimes we've seen it at the regional events where you're plugged into one device and you're talking to a device down the chain. We've seen issues like that, and I don't know if they're addressing it in the new release of this. So the recommendation would be connecting to the actual device, device. if you can, yes. Ah, okay. Yeah. We've seen that issue before. Yeah, you got a question? Sometimes we can't explain it, and that's you know when I get the opportunity, I would go back to Rev Support on that. You know, they've been really good to get back to us on that when we do have issues like that. Some, sometimes at an event when I've seen things like that happen, it'll just act like it can't read it. It almost acts like your cable's being funny. Um, with a lot of these Rev devices, they'll have a little button on them, usually a mode or reset button, something like that. If you power it on while holding that down, it'll put it into a recovery mode, and then it usually pops up in there a lot more reliably. Sometimes maybe something gets messed up in the firmware, something didn't write correctly, but if you put in recovery, reflash it, and set it back up, it usually fixes it. But it's getting better with time. There's been more issues with the rev client in the past, but they've been doing a lot of work on it to improve it. Right. In this slide, here, we put that down. It's not perfect. There's some quirks in there we've seen. Um, but like Logan just said, it's getting better every release of it. And Rev does a really good job when you bring it up. You can check for updates on there. Um, they'll probably not push out anything to kick off on there. But I'm excited to see what they have to offer on there. Because there's a battle between the, the CTRE and the Rev stuff. They're both going so fast on their new motors and that. And things need a little time to shake out. But there is advantage with the REV where you can plug directly in and power the device to do your pre-configuration. That is a nice shining point of that. So if you don't take anything away, make sure you update everything. And if you don't, you flash the individual components so you know which one you're talking about, which one you're setting. It'll save a lot of headache down the road when your programmer is trying to talk to a certain motor and something else is trying to run it. So we're all on the same page from programmers to the builders team and getting your network all to do talking together. Is there any more questions before we move on? Yes. I will say from experience as a CSA, I don't recommend using it. We have seen a lot of them fail out in the wild. They're the little A-Pacer four gigabyte cards. I would get your own, usually something like a SanDisk Industrial, just a well-known name brand. 
Um, they can be any size. You can format it with that tool, and it'll just write whatever. run without it. Next we're going to move into radio configuration. Yes, so your radio, which is this white box right here, we have a set of older <coughs> ones that still look like this. This will be the radio for another year and then it's going to move to a new one, thankfully, because this one's long and we need to be updated. But the way this works is when you're at home anyways, there's a radio configuration so that you can download from the docking station for the control system. And it'll look like this. The first thing it'll ask you is what network interface to select. For most of you, it's just a laptop. It'll be the only one it shows. Um, but to get this started, when you open that utility, you'll just have your radio powered on like this. You'll have an Ethernet cable going to it, and that's going to go to your laptop. And this is what that looks like. It's an older Java application. It's the same thing they've had for about 10 plus years now. Um, it's really, really simple to use. You just type in your T number. You select what type of radio you have. So these ones are called the open mesh radios, these white boxes. Um, there is also, I think, the D-Link option still in there, which is a really old radio from like 2013, 14. You can still use it in off season and for practice if you want to, but most people don't even have one at this point. Um, then you can select the mode. It'll ask for 2.4 gigahertz or five gigahertz. I would do five gigahertz, 2.4 is for if you have a really niche use case, like you're using it across a parking lot at a, at a demo for a sponsor or something like that. Um, five gigahertz allows it to be more reliable and faster speed, so you can be running it more reliably. Um, but yeah, team number, WPA key, you don't really enter that for using this at home. And then robot name is optional. That's just if you wanted to dis distinguish it from another robot that maybe has your team number as well. It just, when it shows the Wi-Fi name, it'll be the team number slash your robot name. So that's optional. Um, then just hit configure, and that will take a moment to do that. Um, sometimes if your radio is really old, like maybe if it's this one, it will also ask you to load firmware. So that's a slightly different process. It'll tell you that, and then you'll just hit that load firmware button, and it'll tell you exactly what to do. It shows all the instructions on the screen. This just says to power cycle it, plug it back in, wait a moment, and it'll just do that for you. Question. Yes. I had a question. I thought I heard something about are they only using this radio for a year or two, or is it, are they well, more the new radio coming out so they can start? They've been, they've been doing some testing, <coughs> with it, but they're going to wait one more year before they use it. So 2024 season will still use that open mesh radio there. Yep. So the, the key about this is when you do the firmware, it's on the boot up. When you go to the events or doing this at your schools, make sure you wait for the radio to be fully booted or else it will not work, okay? Usually at the events, the CSAs are kind of around that table to get your radio configured. I like to tell teams, do it right away when you come in the pits and you're trying to go through inspection, pull that radio off, go to the kiosk and get it programmed right away. My team also uses a backup radio, so after everyone gets kind of done, we uh, usually do a second radio just in case if there's connection issues on the field, we have another radio just to plug in, zip tie on the robot and play a match if we need to. You notice there's a lot, a lot of problems with the other shit, power level improvement, some of the source issues and just because unprogrammed crap. So you'd leave the wall power when you're trying to program the wall. Yeah. So we haven't seen that. anything with the new rev uh, power ethernet there module there. It's a passive e POE and yeah, they've been been really good. We haven't seen fail. A couple teams have seen some things, but overall, you got to remember these radios were never designed to be on a moving robot. These are made to sit on a shelf. They had the barrel jack in there, and before these other devices came out into the FRC world, and first they would use the barrel jack, and then what would happen is they'd vibrate and they'd break the solder leads on them internally. So when people would take them apart, they'd put some um, some heat uh, electrical static type adhesive in there and put the radio back together. They would put uh, different things on it to hold it in there. We like to use a, a 3D printed one to hold the cables in there, make sure they're, they're taunt in there. You know, but the barrel jacks were really susceptible to vibration. Right, the 
because the new one was 18 on there. Right. Yeah, it works with an array. Right. So the scrub one puts out 18 volts, which is at the higher end of the range for that. But well, I don't really think the fact with the PLU ports, when you're running on power over Ethernet, if you're not running the barrel there, I think that ran into problems with some of them a little bit. We've noticed that with our program once in a while, the Crossroad. But if you look on the specs, um, actually going to the radio, I think the spec is it's a 24 volt PLE. It'll run on 12, but then when it does the pro when you actually program it, they can sometimes have some troubles with the trans. You gotta use the 12 volt one, the two amp one on there, and use the voltage rater so constantly just for the voltage of your battery. And so, I'm a big component using the red one because I didn't see any issues. I like that RJ45 to snap in place, and you hear that click, which is good. Sometimes when you see voltage things, you gotta pay attention to the Ethernet cables because there's the two wires in there in that bundle that are causing the power on there and a lot of flexing on there or wrapping on there. Sometimes you'll see them different voltage. And try and keep it as short as possible. I like to keep them nice and tight. Yeah, so this is just some of the status lights on it. Um, these, the blinking blue, so that means it's booting. And again, like he said with these radios, they take a while to boot up. It's about 45 seconds to a minute. And they'll throw you for a loop because when you plug them in, that light will go solid and it'll stay solid for like 10, 15 seconds. So you think it's powered up and ready to go, but it's not yet because it'll turn back off and turn back on and then do that same thing and be ready to go in about 45 seconds. That's another downside of these radios. It's why they're leaving them. They take a very long time to start up. So if you lose connection on the field due to a power cable wiggling or something like that, you're down for like half the match. So that's improving. Um, some of these lights on there, the red just means it's in bridge mode. Um, Yellow is also bridge low, linked or unlinked. That's what you'll see when you're on the field. So what those do is they will no longer broadcast to Wi-Fi, they'll connect to the field's Wi-Fi. But at home, you'll see the green, which is AP mode, which means it's broadcasting Wi-Fi for your laptop to connect to. Pretty easy stuff. This is a couple different ways you can hook it up. There's the rev option there where you connect the ethernet cables to it and it does power over, power over ethernet. That is the recommended way. Um, a way that has been a thing before that came out was with that cable there, that orange one, where you would plug that into a VRM. So like a CTRE VRM or something on the on one of these. Um, you would plug that in and that would just give it 12 volt that's injected into the PoE cable. These work, they're not recommended because it adds a couple more failure points. Um, you have to get that VRM correctly, you have to get the wire done correctly. Some of those PoE injectors are a little shaky internally. Some aren't manufactured to the best standards. But that is another option. Um, generally, we do recommend power over Ethernet when possible. We've had good luck with the rev ones. If you're using a good passcode, you're using a PoE. Yeah. Yep. We ran a few of uh, Ethernet 6, Cat 6 cables, Shield and Heat. <laughs> we have a So the driver station here, we're going to kind of go into some of this on here. We, uh, if you haven't done the, the beta one on here, this is the beta right here running, connected to the board over there. Basically looks the same. There's no other knobs in here, but you know you want to pay attention. What Logan mentioned earlier about the firewall and stuff like that, that will show up on the status on here. Um, these knobs here, and also tells you all your version of your firmware and that, and that's usually where the FMS will catch it too if you're using uh, incompatible firmware or something, and someone forgot to change it, or you have the beta left in there. You know, these things do not play very friendly with the FMS when you're in an event. And then you have to put your team number in there as well. So here's a little bit about the um, firewall stuff and they got the network stuff in here for the public, your domain and all that here and then that will show up in your status there. The other thing is that when you first install it, it will default to the default board here and my team uses shuffleboard, I'm a big component, I wish they would get rid of the uh, smart dashboard but it still shows up, it's still there. Um, there's a lot of teams still using it, it's very viable if you want to. And then uh, getting into some of the debug stuff. So if you do have trouble with your robot and see different discrepancies and stuff going on, and some sluggishness going on or some not working right, there's these log files that come up in there. And they're very helpful for the CSAs because we'll come to you and it will 
show us every match you're in. If there's a qualification match or a practice match, we can go right to that match and it'll give us all the data that's happening. It'll show all your power consumption on all your channels on your power distribution boards. And to get to that, they're over here on this side. There's different ones here that can scroll, but then if you go to this right here, you can go to the view of the log file and they'll come up like this. And you can see right here we have We've been running it today, so it's just different things on here. But you know, up here, you can tell if the robot was in auto mode or teleap. So if something happened between auto and teleap, there's a good way to come in here and see what's going on. Or did you lose a connection? Are you losing packets? You know, is one of your power distribution, like a motor's pulling a lot of current? This is where we go and look at all this stuff, and you can turn them on by these knobs over here and do a different filter. And then you can zoom in as well and go through the trace. You can just do a, an area like this. And then if you mouse over it, you see the voltage down there in the lower left-hand corner in yellow. It'll tell us what the voltage was on here. And then up here, it will tell us the teleop stuff here, the auto. And then right here is your CPU time here. So again, it's very helpful for us as CSAs. It's our diagnostic tool on here, and it works with any um, software version you're using, if you're using LabVIEW, or Java, C++, or the Python coming out this year, this still will be logged in the RoboReal. The other thing, if you have code crashes and stuff like that that kind of come up, you can look at the console, and this is a run log. So if you're using the visual code and you see that real log come up, popping up, if you're using visual code still after you deploy it, this is basically the same window that's being pushed out here. And so you can see if you have a code crash or something got called that shouldn't have called, this is where you'll find it in your log here. Smart dashboard, like I said, is still there. Um, you can put widgets and stuff on here as well and bring different displays up on here. Um, you can break down your subsystems and running and doing your PID loop training on there. Um, this is a good helpful tool for that. The shuffleboard has um, a lot of different features on here. You can do the same type of thing. It's a little more updated than the smart dashboard on here. And we have one run right here. Um, there's a lot of widgets in here. You can bring up the FMS system on here. Um, this is where you can put your auto cho choosers right here for your different autos on here. You can do your camera streams on here. And if you didn't know, when you, when you got connected on here, you can go to the source here. And if you did have a camera server on here, it'd show up on here. And then you could drag it over and put it on your dashboard here. The same thing with your network tables. All this stuff shows up. You can see right down here we have some targets and stuff. We use this to configure stuff all the time on our robot, like set points and stuff on our actuators. If I'm going to a certain set point on an elevator, or set point if I'm rotating something on there. We'll use this to tweak it so I don't have to do a download each time. We can push it to the shuffleboard and do it. You can get values from the right here. You can display different things. And then if you right click on these, you can change it to a graph or whatever you want on here. So I can show it as a different type. I can do it as a simple dial. And you can just drag these larger on these, snap on these grids. Gets to it. This is why I use a mouse still. But the um, features are all on the, on the right click function of these. And then there's widgets in here that you can pull up, like the dashboard stuff here. They actually have a field on here too, if everyone's noticed it in the past. It flew by. Right here, it has last year's field on here. So when the new game comes out, releasing the new pack, we'll have the field eventually loaded up on there as well. A lot of people on these cameras don't uh, s even set this, but you can set your camera compression and your frame rate and um, view on here. <coughs> And it also has stuff on here like you can remove the crosshair and stuff if you don't want that on there. You can 
take it off, put it on there. You can change the color and stuff on there by this utility right here. You change that view. So a lot of things you can do to help debug code and stuff like that when you're going through your iterations and you're doing your build to do stuff with that. Uh, it's got a little sample code there. And then before we do that, I wanted to show you is there's nothing on that motor, Logan, that Falcon. One thing that I like to do is if you go into test mode and you enable the robot, and if you have your shuffleboard or smart dashboard set up correctly, you can go to the live window right here, and then I can actually spin that motor in test mode. How many of you guys knew about that feature? It's very helpful, especially on your drivetrains and that, you want to check direction right away, you can ungroup it and spin each motor individually so you can get your direction set right. And it was more prevalent when you're not using Swerve, because Swerve's got his own stuff to worry about in Swerve with absolute encoders and direction and set offsets and stuff. But on your actuators and stuff and your intakes and that, if you want to make sure that how it was mechanically mounted, that you can come in here and go in test mode and go to the live window and you, these components just show up. So I can run it both directions so I can go ahead and make sure that is so when I code it I know which direction it needs to go. devices on your robot talk together. It's how the radio communicates with your RoboRio. It's how your RoboRio talks with your laptop on the field. It's also how if you have a network switch, this is how you add more Ethernet ports to your robot for things like a Limelight Raspberry Pi. Um, those are all signed by IP address as well. Uh, the RoboRio, well actually the whole robot, follows the IP addresses handed out from your radio and that's based on your team number. So it'll be 10. Dot, if you're 4607, 10.46.07.1.2. whatever beyond that. Um, the rubber reel is usually at dot two, but that's that's how IP addresses are set. That's how your network looks like on your robot. Any questions about that stuff? So when you go to the field, make sure your computer is set to diamondly DACP. It's very critical that you can static it, but they prefer you run the diamond down there so that the FMS can set it from the FMS. We'll go quickly through some troubleshooting things on here. There's all in the manual on here, but as you saw on the light there, if it's a solid light on the, from your low signal light, we saw it was disabled, it flashes when it's um, enabled. Um, these are the troubleshooting things. So I always tell teams also, when you're, when you're doing your designs and stuff, have a way that you can kind of see your lights on here because they, the FTAs look at these lights. If you're having connection issues to the field, they look at these lights and that's how they can help troubleshoot things if something's not working. So they can look at the comm lights on there, see if the radio's connected and all this, and see if it's a radio issue or if it's the rubber reel not booting correctly. And then we're not gonna go through these um, slide by slide here, but they're in the rubber reel manual on, that's installed with everything on here. But all these lights mean something. We use it at CSAs to troubleshoot as we go on there if it's communications or not. If it's an e-stop, it'll be a solid a blinking light for the e-stop, solid green for good communications. And if a brown ounce or anything happens like that on there and roll is disabled, you'll get the other lights here. And the same thing on all the components on here. You'll see a lot of times the sticky faults that come up. And again, go through this. Um, the Rev's got their own different color pattern in there, and we usually post that on our Trello boards and that so we can go through it because we can't memorize all the different light configurations on there. But if you do see something odd, the main point is here, these blinking lights are happening on your devices and stuff. We'll have a meeting to it that you need to address on there. So again, Spark Max here, and this presentation will be posted on our Jumpstart 
robotics website as well as the stream that you can go back and watch the video on. Uh, Limelight is another huge thing that we've been battling over the years on here. This is one device you will stack IP address and it's usually dot 11. And there's a whole utility, uh, Corey Applegate's got a big presentation on Limelight but um, there's a lot of things on here. Uh, here's the network things on here, how you can, you can go into the web server and configure it and there's other utilities with that. We won't go in specifics on that, but be aware that there's light lights and then team number, like Logan was saying, 10 dot team number dot 11 static year line lights. Don't run the DHCP on them. It just doesn't play very fair on there. And then there's, you know, you can do, there's different code samples on there and that. Um, we try to give you as much as we could on different practicalities of what we've seen when we troubleshoot different robots. Make sure your candies and all that and your firmware is up to date. And the big thing we want to also leave you point with here as we're wrapping up is pay attention to the team updates that come out. <laughs> because first we'll update the firmwares or there will be new images of the RoboReal sometimes that come out. Um, the beta for the last uh, couple of years is wide open. This year was really wide open. Anyone could go in there and get the beta code and test it out yourself. And we like to do a little bit of it so we're kind of up to date before the season kicks off, see if there's any breaking changes in some of the calls. But the team updates will have that in there, so pay attention to them. And if it is, for me, it's not an option. We always update to the newest firmware and images that first puts out. It just saves a lot of headache long term because you don't know what some little thing that's nagging you and you can't figure out what's going on, and it's because it's broken. station or even a RoboReal image the night before an event. So just make sure you check on that. Make sure you stay up to date. Um, I think they even have a way you can subscribe to get emails about it too. But they will alert you of that. You need to come prepared to events. Otherwise, we have to go around pit to pit and help everyone get updated so you can actually function on the field. But good to keep on top of. Don't fall behind on that. And again, the you know, CSAs are here to help. Uh, we work closely with the FTAs on the PO to keep everyone on. Our job is to keep everybody running in an event. Um, the resources here, um, he's got the, the zero to robot thing on it, which is super helpful on there. And then the individual vendor documentation on there. Um, the quickest way to get to a lot of this is to say FRC docs in your Google and it will bring you to this website. We're installing on the software, everything will be up, usually updated pretty regular on there. If there's a new update now, you can bookmark that and check everything out on there as well. Again, any questions, some reach out to me and Logan. Um, our Jumpstart website here will have, have this stuff, stuff posted, posted on there as well as be on our YouTube channel. And then first updates now, we'll have this presentation next week.